First of all, thank you very much for this, uh, you know, honorable invitation. Um, I appreciate this uh, opportunity to reflect on, uh, you know, the question that was raised in the conference, um, shared with me by uh, Shahid Mati and Harun Bashir, and also that I had a pleasure to look at the at the, at the abstracts, and I thought that, uh, you know, I'd like to speak to the presentations, the very many different presentations, but also reflect, take the opportunity to reflect on my work. So as you know, the proper relationship between Islamic and modern Western knowledge systems has been a concern, concern for Muslim scholars, schools, and perhaps ordinary people as well. The celebrated works of Abdullah Larwa, Fazlur Rahman, Nagib al Attas, Muhammad Arkun, Ismail Farooqi, and countless others have offered various models for that exact or for that particular relationship. Their models have challenged academics, Muslims, and their societies on how to work with these two systems since the onset of colonial modernity. I see this conference as returning to this question in the context of decolonization. And I hope that this earlier archive will be honored by our deliberation of these earlier models, focusing on their strengths and their weaknesses. It would be a great disappointment if we only limit ourselves, limit our attention to the latest theories whilst ignoring this anti-colonial and post-colonial archive. I join that conversation in three parts. At first, I reflect on the terms that have been used to speak of these, what we call Islamic systems and Western systems. How can we, how do we make sense? How should we begin to even think about these, you know, uh, intellectual systems or civilizational systems as such? What is the value of terms such as language game, paradigm and discourse that have respectively been introduced by Ludwig Wittgenstein, Thomas Kuhn and Michel Foucault? Where do they come from? And how helpful are they for speaking about the knowledge systems of Islam and the modern West? What are the implications of these terms? I begin this talk by drawing a connection between the 20th century terms and their 19th century antecedents. And I raise some critical questions about their value. After that, I go to the second part and I share my entanglement in this field, particularly grappling with the discourses of Islamization and religious studies over many years. That's the third step in my, in my lecture is devoted to reflecting on questions that have escaped these deep frameworks for the study of Islam. I offer them as questions, but also opportunities that may be turned into sustained and systematic research projects. So let me begin with the first part. The work of Michel Foucault has been celebrated for identifying the power and structure that maintains the disciplinary systems of the West. Healing, knowing, punishing, and sex were in Foucault's view products of disciplinary discourses. They were not as natural as the prophets of enlightenment and modernization had claimed and sometimes continue to claim, but epistemic systems created through language. Modernity did not merely replace a religious universe with a more rational and natural one, Foucault claimed, one system of domination and power was replaced by another. Foucault had identified a deep structure that inscribed the intellectual disciplines of the West. It was not long before his insights were applied to other cultural and civilizational contexts. And Islam was no exception. There too, one could identify the discursive constructions of man, woman, sex, place, health, and the world. Foucault continues to cast a long shadow on the study of discourses. But I don't want to stop with Foucault. I think there have been other terms in order to, for us to appreciate fully the, 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 the value of Foucault. Perhaps one needs to also think about other terms before discourse that identified such deep systems, rationalities or frameworks within which scholars worked. Let me just switch off my mail because I keep on hearing the mess, the pings. In 1969, the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, published The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 
in which he argued that scientists did not only work with facts and experiments, but with paradigms that, and I quote, that may be prior to more binding and more complete any set of rules for research that could be unequivocally abstracted from them. Kuhn said that scientists worked in paradigms that were universally recognized, scientific achievements that provided model problems and solutions to a community of practitioners. So somewhat alike Michel Foucault, Kuhn was pointing to this, you know, a paradigm was something that you could find, you could identify, but it is not something that scientists immediately think about because they work within a model, within a, a, a universally recognized scientific, you, they work within a model that provides them the problems and also the probable solutions. Kuhn himself was inspired by Ludwig Wittgenstein that he admits in his book. And Ludwig Wittgenstein suggested that philosophers and others work within language games, which better to describe how they study reality. This particular quotation from Wittgenstein, I think demonstrate this beautifully. He said, when philosophers use a word, knowledge, being, object, I, proposition, name, and try to grasp the essence of the thing. The, the emphasis is in his work. One must always ask oneself, is the word ever actually used in this way, in a language game, with its, with, which is its original home? Again, we find that reality was not a product of rational concepts, but, but a largely unwritten game. Discourses, paradigms, and language games point to distinctive features of human activity, particularly scientific activity, that are not easily discernible. What appears to be natural, scientific, or conceptual investigation and analyses are guided by underlying deep frameworks. This attention to implicit frameworks that produce knowledge, science, or power was adopted by social scientists to deepen their study of the multiplicity of cultures and religions. Let me for a moment just switch off my sharing and then you can perhaps see me talking. I would like to connect their value in the social sciences to the 20th century, in the, in the 20th century, with a late 19th century phenomenon in the emerging social sciences. Scholars then debated the meaning of accounts they found in travelogues, books, missionary and colonial reports from the far corners of European colonial empires. The earlier scholars who looked at these documents identified these accounts as foolish stories of backward peoples in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Latin, Latin America. These interpretations saw an evolutionary process of human history, according to which Europe was far ahead of the primitives who practiced false signs or were, were refusing or were unable to modernize. Later theorists, those who responded to them, rejected these evolutionary theses and adopted a more magnanimous approach to what they called cultures and religions. They suggested that such accounts were not pointing to false science, but rather to primitive science with its own rules and systems of inferences. Others argued that the accounts that they found that the colonialists found from the peripheries ref referred to functional social systems that showed a different, not necessarily unequal way of being in the world. And I'm thinking particularly of the work of Dirk Heimia. The terms language game, paradigm and episteme and, and, and this discourse in the 20th century then, epistemic discourse in the 20th century, ought to be linked to such attempts of making sense of the world in the 19th century. So these terms did make an advancement. It was an advance to the earlier terms, but necessarily, but we should actually recognize and we should not forget the link with these earlier terms. In the 20th century, these new terms like paradigm, discourse, and language game offer different ways of making sense of cultures and religions under study. At least they offered ways of studying you know, other cultures and other religions on par with Western philosophy, science, and modernity. What I want to do is use this history of multiple intellectual systems to make some preliminary remarks on their value. 
I will begin with a point that is often overlooked. None of the three intellectuals, Foucault, Wittgenstein, and Kuhn, was interested in the study of philosophy, science, and cultural systems outside the West. Wittgenstein was interested in understanding the languages of science and their relation to the language of religion in general and the everyday, in the West more mainly. Kuhn was interested in the study of scientific revolutions, who specifically questioned the value of paradigm, of using the word, of using the idea of paradigm for the social and human sciences. He never thought it would be applied by the social scientists. And Foucault's focus was entirely directed at modernity in the West, even though we know modernity was not only created in the West. If these terms were developed to solve problems in philosophy or the history of philosophy, how relevant would they be for the study of religions and cultures? How are they really translated as a problem for, uh, to, to resolve a problem in one discipline for another one? What does one gain and what does one lose from this translation? That is the question that I think we should be asking. We can deepen this question by examining the terms more closely. In the case of Kuhn, we note that he refers to a succession of paradigms. And I'd like to bring up the, uh, oops, sorry. Let me just make sure what happened to my presentation. Oops. Sorry, I thought this would be a smooth flow, but it doesn't, it didn't quite work like that. Okay. Just stay with me. Oh, okay, there I see it now. Sorry about that. So I'd like to refer, return again to Kuhn's uh, definition that I shared with you. Universally recognized scientific achievements that for a time provided model problems and solutions to a community of practitioners. Now it is a central thesis of Kuhn that a new paradigm replaces an older one. Scientific paradigms do not coexist with each other because new ones better explain all the data at hand, both the data of the past and the data that has been discovered in the present. So if we recognize this in the work of Kuhn, are we then justified in using paradigms for a multiplicity of, way of ways of thinking and acting in one place and time? Can we use this to think about you know, different cultures and religions that actually exist in a particular place? I'm suggesting that we critically think about using this term before transporting them and thinking about how, what way we want to use them for. As for language games, I myself have found Wittgenstein's insights fascinating and valuable for thinking about the discourse of Islam. But recently I have begun to ask if his proposition of radically different language games was not ideally suited to the differentiation of spheres that emerged in Europe in the 18th century. The differentiation of spheres suggested that what you do in religion is not necessarily applicable to politics, it's not necessarily applicable to economics, or it's not necessarily uh, applicable to art. Each you know, is, plays a different kind of rules, follows a different kind of, eth a different kind of, of, of logics in, their own, in, the, in, its own, in, the, in, in its own individual system and practice. Would this differentiation have made sense in the colonies where a similar differentiation was not necessarily pursued, as we know from the work of Mamdani on politics in Africa, colonial politics in Africa, I mean. Similarly, does it make sense to leave out scientific, economic, and ethical questions from the language game of religion in general or from the language game of Islam? Another criticism that I cannot shake off about these terms is the relationship between a multiplicity of meanings that is implied by these terms and its political economy. While scholars in the 19th century were formulating alternative frameworks for thinking about cultures, religions, and knowledge systems, they did not often include sustained reflections, and I'm emphasizing sustained reflections on the destruction of some of these very systems through the power of colonialism. So what they often did is that they took these systems and and excluded from them the idea that colonialism was basically destroying the, the very systems that they were, they were actually studying. 
the intellectual systems of, system of Islam, for example, whatever its strengths and weaknesses, was violently marginalized through colonialism. Modern schooling was forced upon Muslims all over the globe when a new world order was imposed on them in the 19th and 20th centuries. Can one then study multiple systems of knowledge without considering the political economy of such frameworks? In the 20th century, these questions have not been completely ignored, but they hardly focus on the politics of hegemony when referring to paradigms and language games. At most, the frameworks of modernization, secularization, and questions of objectivity and subjectivity conceal the relations of power. So I've argued so far then that we use concepts like discourse from Foucault, paradigm from Kuhn, and language game from Wittgenstein to reflect on multiple systems of meaning, knowledge practices, and other assumptions. But I have suggested that the translation of these terms from the philosophy of science or science to cultures and religions comes through a 19th century experience of the world, a 19th century colonial experience of the world. And then I have argued that the apparently positive value of these frameworks needs some critical reflection. Before I continue with that critique, I will share my personal journey through these frameworks. So I've been entangled in these frameworks through Islamization, through the project of Islamization and the study of religions. Islamization cannot be dissociated from the legacy that I have just outlined. And the study of religions has grappled and worked with multiple religious traditions from its very foundation. I joined Temple University in Philadelphia in the 1980s as a student of Professor Ismail al Faruqi, through whom I was introduced to and embraced the Islamization of knowledge paradigm. I embarked on a PhD on Islamic historiography which aimed to eventually transform a Western idea and practice of history into an Islamic one. In the words of Al-Faruqi, students like me were given a project. And I share that from one of, what, one of Farouki's, uh, Farouki's description of this project. Our responsibility was to master all the modern disciplines, understand them completely, achieve an absolute command of all that they have to offer. Then integrate their certain achievements into the corpus of Islamic knowledge by eliminating, amending, reinterpreting, and adapting its components as the worldview of Islam and its values dictate. Determine the exact relevance of Islam to the philosophy, the method and objectives of the, of the discipline, and blaze for a new way in which the reform discipline can save the ideals, can serve the ideals of Islam. As you might agree, this was a meticulous plan, but a daunting task for one a doctoral dissertation. But it captures the idea that knowledge was guided by deep-seated values, ideals, and worldviews. It is not difficult to see how Islamization, as it was, as it is described, as it is defined here, was aligned to the idea of language game paradigm or discourse. But there was, there was one significant difference between these terms and Al-Faruqi's plan for Islamization. And that was his commitment to a universal rational foundation for the study of religion, ethics, and values in general, and, and, and for the rational and universal understanding of Islam in particular. His justification was based on a critical reading of Kalam debates in the past, and ethics in modern philosophy. I do not have time to go through in this. I've discussed this in a paper that I published, but I think I wanted to mention this uh, particular difference between Faruqi and the paradigms that were, and the, and the kind of frameworks that were discussed through uh, adopting discourse, um, uh, paradigm and language. But that consciously, consciously choosing to do so at the time, I did not accept this foundation. I followed Islamization as a paradigm or language game, and I use these two terms explicitly, that, but I felt that they belong to Islam. In this reworking, I found the study of religions the best place in which to locate my approach to Islamization. 
committed to both Islamization and the study of religions meant that the terms that I got from religious studies like myth and ritual were populated by Islamic content. For example, in a study of sermons in South Africa, I developed a method for identifying Islamic discourses of mosques and imams in South Africa. This relied on the discursive construction of spaces, leadership and authority. And you can he hear the echoes of Foucault in, in that statement. But for an interpretation, for my interpretation of the sermons of the khutbahs given in South Africa, I suggested that they exhibited a citation of the Quran between qira'a, recitation, and maqru, that which was recited, that scholars of kalam had been debating in the past over centuries. In this way, I identified a continuity in the discourse of Islam while recognizing its historical context and application. In a later study of biographies of Islamic activists, I suggested that we need both William James and Ghazali to appreciate their life trajectories. Al-Ghazali's reflection on the self, the soul, and the good offered a better understanding of Muslim activists grappling with challenges in late modernity. In all my work, I always trace Muslim discourses to its long history, refashioned for contemporary times. The main analytical terms came from Islamic discourse, the main analytical terms from Islamic discourse occupied a place next to the terms that I obtained from Max Weber, Michel Foucault, Emile Durkheim, Talal Asad, and David Chidister. I hope it is clear how the frameworks of language game, paradigms, and discourse intersected with Islamization. Both were committed to recognizing the deep structure of intellectual projects. But there was a major difference in Al Farouqi's model that, that proposed a universal and rational foundation, which I think goes against these particular frameworks, both in the, in the frameworks in the social sciences and in the way that I pursued. I'd like to turn now to my third uh, part of my presentation. In the last 10 years, I began to question the value of the frameworks that I had adopted for the study of Islam. Through a research project on Islam, African publics and religious values at the University of Cape Town, I began to engage more critically with the discipline of religious studies. At first, it was an attempt to align my work more carefully within this framework. I thought I was always leaving parts out that I should be doing a little bit more carefully. Eventually, however, it has led to an awareness of major gaps in the field. These have been challenging to myself and to my understanding of what I've done in the past, but they suggest and they offer new opportunities for the study of Islam. Studies in these fields are not in studies that I want to point out to you now, are not entirely new, but they represent opportunities for sustained projects and reflections that support the study of Islam. So the first opportunity that I see is an awareness of the place of ethics in the study of religions. Around 2013, I changed my focus of attention from Islamic studies to the study of religious, religious, uh, religious studies in schools to how to introduce the study of religions in South African schools. My initial motivation was to study and provide support for schools to introduce religious studies in the in South African classroom as some of my predecessors in South Africa and other parts of the done. In that experience, however, I came to appreciate that the central purpose of religious, of the relig of religious studies across in schooling across the globe but particularly in the West, was devoted to promoting the values and ethics of all religions for pluralistic societies. Identity was no doubt equally important for religious studies in the classroom, but the ethics of difference was a greater demand made of the subject in schools. More importantly, when I tried to offer models for the, from the history of religions for South African schools, when I met the principals and teachers of South African schools and they asked me, what should we do? I realized how little ethics was developed in the discipline of religious studies. Here in the study of religions, we have reflected extensively on religious experiences, the meaning of cosmos, identities and social bonding 
power and hegemony and hybridities. But until recently, there has been little work done on how ethics and values were created and adapted within religious discourses for contemporary context. I want to emphasize within that ethics has to occupy, to the extent that ethics occupies a place within religious traditions. In the differentiated spheres of languages, language games and discourses, ethics belong to philosophy and to theology, but not to religions. There was certainly a recognition that morality, there was morality in religions, but not ethics, because ethics was defined as critical, deliberative, and self-reflective practices, which was not a feature of religion. So ethics, I propose, must be placed at the center of the study of Islam and not on the periphery. The history of Islam offers great resources for thinking about ethics in the Quran, Hadith, Sharia, politics, Sufism, and philosophy. The stand to ethics is clearly on the rise in a number of works that I have seen recently, but I think it needs more systematic study and reflection. Another mid gap in the modern study of religion was the place of science, particularly modern science. In the light of great advances made by science and by modern science, I'd like to refer to, I always think about Immanuel Kant's reflections on natural religion that, were, that, was, that was constructed in relation to demonstrable justification. So, and the risk of quoting Kant to you, I decided let me show you his definition, his, his quotation definition. I could find this particular definition, which I hope is clear. He says that pre-rational faith can never be transformed into knowledge by any natural data or reason and experience because the ground of holding true is merely subjective, namely a, namely a necessary need of reason to presuppose the existence of a highest being, but not to demonstrate it. And the risk of uh, trying to uh, paraphrase Kant, what he's actually saying there is that you cannot actually demonstrate religion as you can demonstrate science. But my point is actually saying that once science has advanced to a certain, to a certain extent in its philosophy to show what we work, the materials that we work with are only the material that we can find, find evidence for, therefore religion is actually pushed outside of science. And so they, therefore the questions that, 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 are, that are provoked by science about religion, on religion and vice versa, are actually not necessarily dealt with each other. Kant's successes in the 19th and 20th century like Friedrich Schleiermacher and Rudolf Otto continued that legacy of defining a religious experience that was set apart from scientific practice and experience. Other, the theoretical tool, tools terms, the theoretical terms used in the study of religions like myths and rituals were also defined through a distinction from science and proofs. Take for example, this working definition of book of myths in a recent book by Wendy Doniger published in 2011. A myth is above all a story that is believed, believed to be true, and that people continue to believe despite sometimes massive evidence that is in, that is in fact a lie. So this definition contrasts the truth of history with the meaning of a myth. The former would be supported by shared with shared evidence, which the latter lacked in one form or another. Once that distinction was made between what was scientifically or historically verified and what was not, the study of religions largely vacated the development of science and technology. The sphere for the religious was thus made clear. What I'm suggesting is that science and technology, their possibilities and their threats cannot be excluded from the study of Islam. What was the relationship between the science, between science and Quranic studies in the past? Would such relations have to be changed in the light of modern science? What were the costs of separating science from religious justification? The history of religions in the modern economy has suggested that the scientific and the religious do not meet. An Islamic discourse or an Islamic a study of Islam, as you can see, I keep on slipping Islamic discourse in there, even though I realize the problem of using this term now. 
the study of Islam that reaches into the past cannot afford this indulgence. I think another, the third one, opportunity that awaits the study of Islam is a sustained way, in a sustained way, is the sphere of economics, or more accurately, moral economies. More than objective or subjective knowledge, in my view, the capitalist economy has formed the bedrock of the modern for its power and global economy. Certainly the idea of objective science of, and the idea of objective, objective knowledge has been very, very successful at justifying the power of modern systems of knowledge. But I think it is the power of capitalist economy that has actually pervaded society. While the political project of the colonial modern, of the colonial modern ebbs and flows, the ethic of capitalism seems to be unstoppable in its reach and effect. One term that we have found useful for our reflection in our project has been the idea of a moral economy, first used by E.P. Thompson in reference to bread writers who rejected the introduction of capitalist values in English markets in the 18th century. He suggested that moral economies refer to economic practices that are radically different from the market rules of capitalism. Careful attention to the moral economies that have been revived in many parts of the world calls for robust appreciation and research. Such moral economies cannot be studied without reflecting on their resistance or capitulation to capitalist norms and forces. For the study of Islam, this attention to moral economies begun to turn to its history of conquests, markets, and production. From the Quran, Sorry, I, meant, I, should, I want to rephrase it. For the study of Islam, this moral attention to moral economies has, must begin with a turn to its history of conquest, markets, and production. From the Quran through jurisprudence, theology, and politics, study of moral economies can shed light on, this, on, on, on an important dimension of Islam. As is well known, Islamic economics emerged in the 1970s within the project of Islamization and seems to have made great strides in banking and finance. I would consider Islamic economics as, as, a, as a good example of moral economy in the past, in the, in the present. But I think Islamic economics uh, should be more critically studied as well because its mode of resistance seems to have succumbed to capitalist practices with banking. So I call for a more systematic study of moral economies that can be historically illuminating and is extremely relevant to the challenge of globalization, value-making and development. So my con con conclusion, I have suggested that we think carefully and critically of the value of shared frameworks that we often use in our study of Islamic and particularly Western uh, intellectual systems. I do not want to reject the value in, the, in their entirety. But I do think the histories and assumptions in the intellectual history of colonial modernity needs critical engagement. I suggested then that Islamization may be considered part of this legacy. And I noted the distinct difference between these frameworks and, Isla and Islamization as proposed by Ismail al-Farouk. His universal and rational foundation needs some critical discussion in the study of Islam. I was and remain unconvinced of its value and its feasibility, but I'm aware that his argument is rooted in the exclusive claim to truth in Islamic discourse. Either I like to think of that truth in, not necessarily in objectivity, but in a critical reflection of the meaning of revelation. And I've argued in some of my work that the post-prophetic discourse of Islam has not sustained, cannot, cannot sustain objectivity in a satisfactory way. More importantly, I have, offered, I have offered some ideas that the multiple frameworks of the social sciences have until recently been blind to some key aspects of contemporary life and the history of Islam. It seems that the particular history of the disciplines and their overarching frameworks have not developed ethics, science, and moral economies in their studies, in their, in their, in their, in their archive. 
And I, could, I think that ethics, science, and moral economies are the universals of contemporary societies that cut across the globe. They offer opportunities, therefore, for, for the study of Islam. Such universalities in the modern world, modern world need more attention than the claims of objective knowledge or faith claims. They are more useful than identities and alternative intellectual frameworks that seem to pre preoccupy our attention. I thank you for your attention and look forward to your critical comments.